क्लास टेन ड्रामा टू जूलियस सेजा बाय विलियम शेक्सपियर सम इम्पॉर्टेंट कैरेक्टर्स जूलियस सेजा द ग्रेटेस्ट एंड मोस्ट पावरफुल ऑफ द रोमन्स assassinated by Brutus Cassius and a band of conspirators who feel Caesar is very ambitious and wants the crown Calpurnia Caesar's wife Mark Antony Caesar's most loyal friend Marcus Brutus Caesar's great friend who joins the conspiracy because of his great love for Rome and for democracy Cassius inspires an organizer of the conspiracy Decius Brutus co conspirator in Caesar's assassination explanation of the chapter act to seen to Caesar's house there was thunder and lightning in the sky Caesar entered wearing his night gown Caesar said that the heaven and the earth had been restless all night his wife Calpurnia had been seeing nightmares She had cried thrice in her sleep and sought help as she dreamed that Caesar was being murdered. Caesar called out that he was there inside the room. A servant appeared. The servant addressed Caesar as my lord and asked for orders. Caesar ordered him to call the priest and ask him to offer sacrifices to God to get their opinions regarding his future based upon the nightmares seen by Calpurnia. Servant went out to do the needful. Calpurnia appeared. Calpurnia asked Caesar that what did he mean by walking ahead out of the house despite the nightmares seen by her? She asked him not to move out of the house that day as she feared him being murdered. Caesar replied that he shall walk ahead. He added that the enemies who threatened to kill him only planned to do so behind his back, but they did not have the courage to face him. When they would see Caesar's face, they would disappear due to fright. Calpurnia replied that she never believed in omens and forecasts but this nightmare had scared her. Now she was afraid as she had seen and heard horrible things in the dream. She describes the nightmare where she saw a lioness give birth to its young once in the street. She saw that the graves had opened and the dead persons walked out of them. She saw all the brave soldiers in the order of their ranks fight in a bloody war and the noises could be heard all around. There were sounds of the horses neighing and the soldiers who were dying in pain. She said that all of them were unnatural and so she was in fear. Caesar said that all the happenings had been predestined by God and what had to happen would happen. So he shall also continue his work and go ahead with it. He said that Calpurnia's nightmare applied to Caesar as it applied to the world in general and it did not have any cause for him to fear if. Calpurnia said that when a common man referred as a beggar died there were no heavenly predictions to indicate that but when a brave prince died the heavens who made such predictions got so disturbed that they set themselves on fire to announce such great tragedies She wanted to say that the nightmare that she saw was so intense as if the heavens had set themselves on fire to for one of a great tragedy the murder of Caesar Caesar said that cowards die many times before their death any act of coward is equal to being dead The brave men died only once in their lifetime He further added that out of all the amazing things that he had heard it was strange that men feared death As death was unavoidable and had to come one day it would come when it had to So he did not fear death The servant reappeared Caesar asked the servant about the forecast made by the priests. The servant said that the priests had advised that Caesar should not go out of the house that day. When the inner organs of the animal that had been offered as a sacrifice were plucked open, they found that the animal's heart was not there. 
Caesar replied that the gods reacted by removing the animal's heart as they looked down upon the cowardly act of Caesar to fear death. He added that he would be that animal without the heart if he stayed back at home that day. He refused to stay back and said that danger knew that Caesar was more dangerous than it. He added that he and danger were like two lions who had been born on the same day and as he was the elder one, was more terrible than danger. So, he announced that he shall go out of the house. Calpurnia expressed sadness as Caesar's wisdom had been shadowed by overconfidence. She asked him not to go out because her fear for her sake and not due to his fear. She offered to send Mark Antony in his place to the Senate. She suggested that Mark would say that Caesar was absent as he was unwell. She begged on her knees and asked him to give permission for it. Caesar feels humiliated by Calpurnia's idea. He did not approve that for her sake that he would stay back at home and that Mark Antony would say in the Senate that he was unwell. Decius Brutus appeared. Caesar said that Decius Brutus would say so in the Senate. Decius greeted Caesar and said that he had come to take him for the meeting at the Senate. Caesar said that Decius had appeared at the right time. He asked him to greet the senators on his behalf and to tell them that he would not come to the Senate that day. He added that saying that he cannot come was untrue and that he dare not to come was more untrue. He said this because it was not that he was unable to go or that he feared going out of the house. He was not going for some other reason, his wife Calpurnia's fear and subsequent request. He asked Decius to tell the Senate that he would be absent that day. Calpurnia asked Decius to say that Caesar was sick. Caesar asked Calpurnia that should he tell a lie to the Senators. He further asked her that in the battles, had he killed so many innocent people that he should feel guilty and not be able to tell the truth to the group of hateful old men. He asked Decius to go and tell them that he would not come that day. Decius who was a part of the conspiracy to kill Caesar asked him for a reason to give for his absence lest he should be laughed upon by the senators. Caesar told him the reason for not going out of the house was that his wife Calpurnia saw a nightmare in which Caesar's statue was immersed in a fountain of blood that flowed from a hundred spouts. Many great men of Rome came smiling towards it and washed their hands with his blood. She treated it as a forewarning of a tragedy and so had begged on her knees for him to stay at home that day. Decius said that they had interpreted the dream incorrectly. It was a fair dream and signified good fortune. Caesar's blood symbolized his spirit and love for Rome and that the great men shall soak their handkerchiefs with his spirit and patriotism to retain his mementos. Caesar was convinced with Decius's words and said that he had explained it well. Decius said that he had explained well as Caesar understood what he said. He added that the Senate was due to crown him as the ruler that day and that if he did not go, they might change their mind. He wanted to take Caesar to the Senate so that the senators along with him could murder Caesar. Caesar said that Calpurnia's fear was foolish and that he was ashamed to have accepted it and decided to remain at home that day. He asked for his robe as he decided to go to the Senate. Enter Publius Brutus L-I-G-A-R-I-U-S M-E-T-E-L-L-U-S Cast T-R-E-B-O-N-I-U-S and Chinna Publius Brutus Ligurius Metallus Cast Trebonius and Chinna Repair Caesar invited his friends for some wine and said that they would go together to the Senate. Brutus was a true friend of Caesar and he knew that the other men envied him.
He went to a side and said to himself that his heart was pain to see that being like a friend was not like being a friend. Excellent. All the men exit the stage. Act 3 Scene 1 The next scene is set in the capital, Rome with the Senate seated above. Flourish. Enter Caesar, Brutus, Cassius, Cass, D-E-C-I-U-S, Brutus. M-E-T-E-L-L-U-S-C-I-M-B-E-R-T-R-E-B-O-N-I-U-S, Chinna, Antony, L-E-P-I-D-U-S, P-O-P-I-L-I-U-S, Publius and others. The senators stood up to welcome the men as they arrived Caesar, Brutus, Cassius, Cast, Decius, Brutus, Metellus, Simba, Trebonius, Chinna, Antony, Lepardus, Popelius, Publius and others enter the senate. Caesar asked that was the senate ready to begin the session or was something missing that needed to be corrected before they started the session. Metlis Simber addressed Caesar as the highest, most powerful man. He fell in front of him with respect and sat on his knees. Caesar said that Simba should stop doing these acts of bowing and bending before him as these could influence ordinary men but not Caesar. He added that by doing such acts he would not be able to change the law of the land or alter any past orders. He added that Simba's brother had been punished by the law and if Simba bent, bowed and tried to praise Caesar to get him free, Caesar would push him out of his way like a dog. He also said that Simba should remember that Caesar did no wrong acts and would not be satisfied to release a guilty person without a valid reason. Metlis Simba called out to the senators and asked that a worthy man than him request Caesar on his behalf. Maybe Caesar would like the other person's words and cancel his brother's punishment. Brutus supported Simba and said to Caesar that he was kissing his hand not to praise him to get Simba's aim fulfilled but he desired that Simba should get the freedom of cancellation of punishment. Caesar was shocked that Brutus supported Simba. Cassius also spoke up and asked Caesar to excuse Publius Simba and release him from the prison. Cassius said that he would change his mind if he was Caesar upon seeing the requests of another person. If he could pray and beg a person to change his mind then he would also do the same if another person begged and prayed to him. But he said that he was not like that, he was fixed in his decisions like the stationary northern star which is the only one that remains fixed in one position in the entire sky. He said that he had always thought that Simba should be punished and he was firm in his decision. Cass said that his hands would speak for him. Cass first, then the other conspirators in Brutus tap Caesar. He and the other senators injure Caesar with a knife. Even Brutus who was a friend of Caesar stabbed him. Caesar was shocked to see that his friend Brutus was a part of the conspiracy to kill him. His dying words were that even Brutus wanted to kill him. Chinna shouted that with Caesar's death the Romans got freedom from his dictatorship. He ordered his men to run around the kingdom and announced that Rome had got freedom. Cassius asked the senators to stand on the stage and announce that they had gained freedom from slavery. Brutus announced the entry of Mark Antony who was a true friend of Caesar. Re-enter Antony. Antony re-entered the senate. Welcome Mark Antony. Brutus welcomed Antony. Antony was heartbroken to see his dear friend Caesar's dead body. He said that the powerful Caesar was lying so low on the ground and that all his achievements, victories and trophies of wars were insignificant because such a noble man had been betrayed and murdered by his own men. He bid him farewell. He addressed the senators and said that he did not know the reason behind killing Caesar who was the most noble Roman. 
He said that for him, there was none other better time to get killed than the time when the great Caesar had been killed, none other better sword to get killed with than the sword with which Caesar had been killed. The sword which had killed Caesar was rich as it was smeared with the blood of the most noble man in the world. He begged the senators that if they hated him, now when their hands were smeared with Caesar's blood, they smelled of it, they should fulfill their desire of killing him too. If he lived for a thousand more years, he shall not find a better time to die than that time, no better place to die than there are no better person to die at the hands of than those who had murdered Caesar. He addressed the conspirators as the masters of the age as they were the rulers of Rome and would destine the future of the Romans. Brutus tried to justify the act of the senators. He asked Antony not to beg for death. He said that they appeared to be cruel as he saw their hands which were full of Caesar's blood. He could not see their hearts which were full of pity for the people of Rome. Their hearts said pity for Caesar also but as fire drives out fire, so did their pity for the Romans drove out their pity for Caesar and so, they killed him. For Antony, their swords were blunt, their arms may appear to be full of hatred but their hearts considered him to be their brother. They welcomed him to the Senate with love and respect. Cassius said to Antony that his opinions would be considered while appointing new officers. Antony said that all the senators were wise, and he had no doubt about it. He asked all the conspirators to shake their hands soaked with Caesar's blood with him. He added that the senators may consider him to be either a coward or a flatterer. He could not justify himself, but the fact was that he loved Caesar. Caesar's soul would be watching them and would be saddened to see that Caesar's friend Antony was befriending and shaking hands with his enemies in the presence of his dead body. Cassius reacts and calls Antony. Antony begged Cassius to excuse him. He added that even Caesar's enemies would feel like that for him because Caesar was such a good man. He, being a friend of Caesar, was being modest and reasonable and saying such things for him. Cassius said to Antony that he did not blame him for praising Caesar. He asked that what agreement did he have with the conspirators, was he a friend of theirs or should they proceed without him? Antony replied that he shook hands with them because he considered them to be a friend. He was swayed by emotions as he saw Caesar's dead body, but he was their friend and loved them. He asked them that now that they were friends, they would explain that how and why was Caesar dangerous for Rome that they murdered him. He hoped that they would reply to his question. Brutus replied to his question and said that their hearts were so full of serious consideration and reason that if Antony was Caesar's son, he too would be satisfied with it. Mark Antony was satisfied with their reasoning. He pretended to be satisfied so that he could take revenge else he feared that they would murder him too. He requested the senators to allow him to take Caesar's body to the stage in the marketplace and give a speech at Caesar's funeral. Brutus allowed Mark Antony to do that. Cassius called Brutus to a side and talked to him. He said that Brutus did not realize the consequence of what he was doing. He asked him not to allow Antony from giving the speech at Caesar's funeral as his speech would make the Romans sympathize with Caesar. Brutus said that he sought permission to be the first one to give a speech and tell the Romans the reason for Caesar's death. Then he would announce that Antony would give a speech and that he had the permission to do so. Brutus said to Antony to take Caesar's body. He directed him that he was not allowed to blame them for killing Caesar, but he could only praise Caesar in his speech. 
If he did not obey them then they would not be his friends and they would not allow him to participate in Caesar's funeral. He shall speak from the same stage from where Brutus would give the opening speech. Antony replied that he did not want anything more than the chance to give a speech in praise of Caesar. Brutus ordered him to prepare the body for funeral and then come to the stage. Exit all but Antony. The conspirators exit and Antony is alone with Caesar's body. Antony said that Caesar's body was bleeding and was like a piece of earth as it had been rendered lifeless. Antony sought pardon from Caesar as he was being gentle with his murderers. He added that Caesar was the noblest man that would ever be born on the earth. He took an oath over Caesar's blood and the wounds on his body which were unable to speak and looked like ruby red colored lips. He took an oath that his voice and the words that he spoke would bring a curse upon the limbs of those men who had murdered Caesar. He vowed that there shall be anger, war, blood, destruction all over Italy. Mothers shall see that their newborn children have been cut into pieces at the hands of the war which will ensue. No one shall have pity in their hearts any longer as they will become used to such sights of terrible deeds. Caesar's soul will be accompanied by the goddess of revenge it who will descend from hell. They shall create havoc and shall let loose fierce dogs of war. The smell of the decaying dead bodies will be filled in the sky as the dead men will cry and beg for a burial. The Forum Act 3 Scene 2 Enter Brutus and Cassius and a throng of citizens. The next scene is set at the Forum. Brutus and Cassius enter along with a huge crowd of Romans. The Romans sought for an explanation for Caesar's murder. Brutus said that if they wanted one, they must listen to him. A man said that he would hear Brutus speak. Brutus appeared on the stage. Second man said that the noble Brutus had arrived, so everyone should remain silent. Brutus asked the crowd to be patient till he ended his speech. He said that if they respected him, considered him to be a wise man, then they must believe him too. He added that if there was any close friend of Caesar then he should know that Caesar was a dear friend of Brutus also. Then he gave the reason for him to go against Caesar and be a part of the conspiracy to murder him. He said that he loved Rome more than he loved Caesar. He said that rather than have Caesar alive and all the people of Rome be his slaves, it was better that Caesar was dead and all the people lived with freedom. Brutus was sad that Caesar was dead as he was a beloved. He was happy that Caesar had been a fortunate man. He honored his bravery but he slayed him due to his ambitious nature. He called out if there was a slaver who did not love Rome in the gathering who had been offended by their act. He waited for a reply from the gathering. The gathering replied that there was no one who considered his act to be wrong. Brutus said that then they had not offended anyone by killing Caesar as the people could kill him also if he became ambitious like Caesar. The reasons for Caesar's death had been given in the capital. Just like Caesar was glorified for his good deeds, he had been punished for his wrong acts. Enter Antony and others with Caesar's body. Mark Antony arrived with Caesar's body. Brutus said that Caesar's body had arrived, warned by his friend Antony who had no role in Caesar's killing but he shall get the benefit of being a part of the free republic. Brutus ended his speech by saying that he was ready to face the same knife which had killed Caesar if his country wanted his death. The crowd raised slogans that it wanted Brutus to live. The first citizen said that Caesar's body be brought with celebrations. The second citizen said that Caesar's statue should be erected along with his ancestors. 
third citizen said that he should be kept alone as Caesar. The fourth citizen said that the good qualities of Caesar are there and Brutus and for that he should be crowned as the emperor of Rome. The first citizen said that they would carry Caesar's body up to his house with shouts and uproars. Brutus called out to his countrymen. The second citizen asked the crowd to be silent and listen to Brutus. The first citizen asked for silence. Brutus said to the crowd to let him leave alone and for his sake stay there with Antony. They must give respect to Caesar's body and listen to Antony's speech as he would praise Caesar. The Senate had allowed Antony to speak and that no one should leave till he has completed his speech. Brutus left. First citizen asked the crowd to remain there and listen to Antony. Third citizen asked Antony to go to the days as they were ready to hear him. Antony said that he was observing the crowd for the sake of Brutus. Goes into the pulpit. Antony walked onto the stage. The fourth citizen asked that why did Antony refer to Brutus. This showed that the crowd was sensitive and was not ready to hear anything against Brutus. Third citizen clarified that he said that he was observing the crowd for the sake of Brutus. The fourth citizen warned that it would be good for him if Antony did not speak anything against Brutus. The first citizen spoke up that Caesar was a dictator. The third citizen added that for sure they had been blessed by getting rid of Caesar. The second citizen asked them to be quiet and listen to what Antony had to say. Antony addressed the crowd as gentle Romans. The citizens asked each other to be at peace and hear him. Antony asked all his friends, his countrymen, the Romans to hear him. He was there for the burial of Caesar's body and not to praise his worthiness. The wrong acts done by men are remembered even after their death, but their good acts are forgotten as soon as they die and are buried with their bodies. The good Brutus had said that Caesar was an ambitious man and if he was one, it was a serious misdeed committed by him. He had caught a serious punishment for it and had to pay for it with his life. He was speaking at his funeral with the permission of all the honorable men of Rome. He said that Caesar was his friend, he was faithful and just to him. On the contrary, Brutus said that he was an ambitious man. As Brutus was a noble man, it was considered that he was speaking the truth. Did Caesar's act of capturing many enemies and bringing them to Rome, for whose return Rome had earned a lot of money, show that he was an ambitious man? Caesar used to cry to see the poor man cry but an ambitious man ought to be hard-hearted. Brutus had alleged Caesar to be ambitious and he was a noble person so he was saying the truth. On the contrary, at the feast of the Lupical, Antony had thrice offered the crown to Caesar, but he refused it which did not show that he was ambitious. Again, Antony said that Brutus was a noble man and he had said that Caesar was ambitious. He added that he did not want to prove that Brutus was wrong, but he wanted to put forth the facts that he knew were true. All the people of Rome loved Caesar, but something was stopping them from mourning his death. They had lost their power of judgment and reasoning. He asked them to excuse him for saying this. He was very sad and he had lost his heart which was lying next to Caesar's body in the coffin. He wants to say that he was merely alive but had lost his emotions upon seeing the dead body of his friend. He stopped himself from speaking further as in his anguish he would speak words which were not appreciable. The people react on hearing Antony. The first citizen says that Antony's words make sense. 
The second citizen said that if the first citizen felt Antony to be right then Caesar had been wronged by the senators who had killed him. Third citizen said to the first and second that he feared that he next emperor would be worse than Caesar. Fourth citizen said that Antony said that Caesar refused the crown which indicated that he was not ambitious. First citizen said that they must bid goodbye to Caesar. Second citizen said that Antony's eyes had turned red as he had been weeping. The third citizen said that Antony was the most noble man in Rome. The fourth citizen asked everyone to hear Antony's speech. Antony said that till the time Caesar was alive his words were heard but now his speechless body was lying there. There was no one in Rome who was so poor that he could not pay respect to Caesar. If Antony enraged the crowd and guided them to revolt against Caesar's killers then he would do wrong to Brutus and Cassius as he had promised them that he would not speak bad about them. As they were honorable men he would not speak bad about them rather he would speak bad about the dead Caesar about himself and about the people of Rome. Antony presented a document with Caesar's seal on it which was in Caesar's cupboard. It was his will. He was reluctant to read it as the people would be stirred with emotions upon hearing it. They would react by kissing Caesar's wounds, dipping their handkerchiefs in his blood to keep as mementos, begging for a strand of his hair as a member and would pass these things on to their next generations to be kept as a rich heritage as the member of the noblest Roman Caesar. The fourth citizen said that they wanted to listen what was written in the will. All the people asked Antony to read out Caesar's will. Antony asked the crowd to be patient. He said that the will must not be read to them. He did not want to tell them that Caesar loved the Romans. As they were neither made of wood nor made of stones but were living men, they would get very angry and become mad to know that Caesar loved them so much that he had bequeathed all his belongings to the people of Rome. He feared the consequences of it. The fourth citizen urged Antony to read Caesar's will. Antony wondered if the crowd would be patient enough to hear him. He thought that he had exceeded his limits by referring to Caesar's will as by reading it out he feared that he would harm the reputation of the so-called honorable men of Rome who had conspired and killed Caesar. The fourth citizen replied that the conspirators who had killed Caesar were traitors. The crowd asked Antony to read the will. The second citizen also repeated that the killers were bad men. He asked Antony to read the will. Antony said that as the crowd had forced him, he wanted them to form a circle around Caesar's body. He would show them the Caesar who had made the will. He sought permission to come down from the stage. The people asked him to come down from the stage. The second citizen asked Antony to come down. The third citizen said that Antony had their permission to come. Antony came down from the stage. The fourth citizen asks all the people to form a circle around Caesar's body. Antony said to the people that if they had tears in their bodies then they must prepare themselves to clear. He showed Caesar's cloak which he had worn for the first time when he had defeated the Gallic tribes in 57 A. D. He showed them the wounds that had been instilled in Caesar's body by the jealous Cass. He said that as Cass took out the dagger from Caesar's body, blood flowed along. The blood gushed out of Caesar's body as if it tried to resolve the issue due to which these men had stabbed him. He added that Brutus was so unkind as he stabbed Caesar mercilessly. Brutus was loved by Caesar and had betrayed him. The stab made by Brutus took away Caesar's life as it was the harshest as Caesar realized that he had been betrayed by a friend. His powerful heart was broken and he fell at the base of Pompey's statue. 
With Caesar's fall, all the Romans fell as Rome's betrayers became victorious. He saw them weep for Caesar's death and had pity for him. Their tears were precious drops and that they should stop them from falling as they held Caesar's dress which had been wounded and smeared by his traitors. The first citizen commented that Caesar's body was pitiable. The second citizen grieved that Caesar was a noble man. The third citizen said that it was a sad day. The fourth citizen said that the killers had betrayed Rome, they were bad men. The first citizen said that Caesar's blood-soaked body was the result of the cruelest act. The second citizen said that they would take revenge for this. The crowd was enraged and shouted to seek revenge for Caesar's killing. They wanted to find the killers and slay them. They said that no one of the conspirators should remain alive. Antony asked the people of Rome to stop. The first citizen asked the crowd and listened to the noble Antony. The second citizen said that they were ready to hear him, follow him and even die with him. Antony addressed the crowd as his good friends and said that he did not want to arouse a wave of violence. He was said that he did not know what personal indifferences did the conspirators have with Caesar due to which they murdered him. As they were wise men and commanded respect, they would have valid reasons for killing Caesar. He did not want to make the crowd hard-hearted and fill their hearts with hatred. He said that he was not skilled at public speaking like Brutus was but was a straightforward person instead. The senators who permitted Antony to give the speech knew that he was neither intelligent nor did he have the art of public speaking and so he would not be able to arise the crowd against them. Antony only spoke the truth and showed them the wounds on Caesar's body. The open wounds were like mouths which could not speak for justice. Antony said that if he were as good as Brutus at public speaking, then he would have been able to arouse the crowd to become violent and become the voice of Caesar's wounds. Then he would be able to provoke them to seek justice on behalf of the wounds on Caesar's body. Even the stones the stone-hearted people would be moved with emotions and seek justice. The crowd rose to violence. The first citizen said that they would burn the house of Brutus. The third citizens called the crowd to move and look for the conspirators. Antony stopped the crowd again as he wanted it to hear him speak. The crowd stopped to listen to Antony. Antony said that he had not yet told them that Caesar deserved to be loved by the Romans. They had forgotten to read Caesar's will. All the men said that they will hear the will before leaving. Antony showed them the will which had Caesar's official stamp on it. He read it Caesar had bequeathed 75 silver coins to every citizen of Rome. The second citizen commented that Caesar was the most noble man and that they would seek revenge for his death. The third citizen commented that Caesar was generous. Antony wanted to read further and asked the crowd to be quiet. The crowd screamed for silence. Antony read the will further and said that Caesar had bequeathed his gardens, the flowery shelters and the fruit trees by the side of the Tiber River to the people of Rome. They were for the Romans to use for recreation. He added that this was the true Caesar and he was a rare person. The first citizen said that they would treat Caesar's body like a sacred object and burn it at a sacred place. They would take the burning wood from Caesar's pyre and burn the houses of his killers with it. He asked the crowd to pick the body. The second citizen asked for fire. The third citizen suggested that they could pull the benches out and use the wood for fire. The crowd was so restless that it could wait no longer. 
The fourth citizen suggested that he pull anything forms window frames h. The citizens went with Caesar's body. Antony said to himself that now the crowd would work on its own and deliver justice to Caesar. He said that now bad behavior had started and it would take further course of action that it deemed appropriate. Antony excited the stage. After the extractor, Antony instigates the mob to revenge. He then sits with Octavius Caesar, Julius Caesar's nephew, coldly calculating how to purge any future threat. Brutus and Cassius fall apart as the idealist in Brutus is outraged by Cassius' practicality. The armies of Octavius Caesar and Antony clash with those of Brutus and Cassius at Philippi and Sardis. Brutus and Cassius are defeated and both commit suicide.